In August last year, 2019, Google announced the Google Cloud Platform GCP price to promote security research of GCP. With a price of $100,000 to the reporter of the best vulnerability affecting GCP reported through the Vulnerability Rewards Program and having a public write-up. The Google Cloud Platform is basically the Google version of Amazon's AWS services or Microsoft's Azure. So you have stuff like Compute Engine, which is generally purpose VMs or even fancy machines with GPUs, various networking stuff like DNS or CDNs, and of course database and storage solutions, loads of different stuff. We have actually used BigQuery from it before to scan through GitHub repositories and look for Bitcoin wallets. And I made one video with the bug hunter Wouter about one bug he found in the Google Cloud Shell, this in-browser IDE. I actually heard about this price when I went to the Google CTF finals in November 2019 and there Eduardo reminded everybody of it. Okay, so one thing that happened recently is that we launched something called the GCP prize where we're going to give $100,000 to one reporter that finds the best bug related to GCP. Uh, the only caveat is that we wanted to be a public write-up about it and uh, the bug must be reported in 2019. And when I heard that, I thought, Damn, 100k on top of the regular bug reward? I should definitely participate. Well, so let me be honest, I didn't participate. I was very intimidated by the huge target. Also, I have no prior Google bug hunting experience and I thought for 100k I'm sure every bug hunter is going for it. I have no chance. This is very typical thinking for me, and I assume a lot of people feel the same way, and now it's too late anyway, 2019 is over. But Google shared with me the nominations, and I thought it would be interesting to analyze what kind of bugs were found, their impact, and thinking critically if I could have found them myself. This is very useful for learning. Occasionally you should do that too. Now let's look at the first bug by OBMI. I assume this is OBMI Hill, currently ranked 13 in the Google Bug Hunter Hall of Fame file upload CSRF in Google Cloud Shell. The bug was a CSRF, cross-site request forgery, which means if a user is logged into the Google Cloud Shell and visits a malicious domain, this website can perform actions across origin on behalf of the user, in this case uploading an arbitrary file. Anyway, as I mentioned at the beginning, Walter's bug was also about Cloud Shell, so I skip an introduction here. If you need one, check out that video, I link it below. So apparently one area of Cloud Shell can be accessed directly by either of those URLs. If I launch Cloud Shell, might uh, take a moment, and then launch the editor, I can observe that this dev shell app spot URI is used. Opening up, that directly opens the editor itself. However, there appears to be a second URL. It looks more like an internal URL, but certain functionality is the same on it. It could be that the first domain is a reverse proxy for that second domain. And it turned out that that second URL was missing the CSRF protection. What does that mean? We have something called the same origin policy, which means when you browse to domain one, that website cannot generally access data from a different domain two. For example, it can't write JavaScript to just read the content. But simple form submissions, so basic HTTP POST request with a form is possible. That's why the domain 2 needs a CSRF protection to make sure requests came from a trusted source. Typically, this is implemented as a secret token. The malicious domain 1 doesn't know the random value, so when it sends that request, domain 2 can reject it. Another option is via a special HTTP header, because due to the same origin policy, the domain 1 cannot add special headers to that request. And so the main URL required such a header, here called XXSRF protected but the second URL was missing it. So either they forgot to add it, or this internal URL shouldn't be reachable directly and be always only accessed through the first. Not sure. So domain one could simply create a post request to upload a file, but there were actually two challenges. First, you need a multi-part file upload, which you can't really do without a user selecting a file in the file dialog. You could probably try to trick the user into that, but OBMI found a bug in the multi-part request parsing. Instead of this request structure, OBMI sent the following request. Content disposition form data name equal upload file name, the file name. 
Now this looks similar to the content disposition here, but look closely at the quotes. Here it starts and here it ends. This was achieved with a regular form input element. This is the name, equal, and then comes the value. And for crazy reasons, this was interpreted on the server as a multi-part form data file upload with content disposition. What the hell? Who comes up with it? I've never seen this kind of wrong parsing of the request and I would have never guessed to test for that. What a weird bug. Now the second challenge. How to know the victim's cloud shell hostname? Because the domain is unique for each user. Which means you need to somehow leak it to construct the form with the correct action URL. And here they mention another trick that I wouldn't have thought about. OBMI noticed that during some redirects during authentication, it redirects an authenticated user to their unique URL. And then the result of the redirect can be hijacked via CSP reports. More detailed information about this auth redirect is in another report by OBMI, but let me reproduce this with a small test to show how it works in principle. So here I have a malicious attacker website. It contains an iframe embedding the authentication URL. When accessing it, it will redirect to the unique URL of the user that visits that site. I also set the CSP header to only allow the authentication domain test.liveoverflow.com as a frame source. And any CSP violation I want to get reported to me. And let's check what happens. If this is embedded as an iframe on the malicious user domain, we see the iframe got blocked. Because testliveoverflow.com was allowed, but it redirected to the unique dev domain not whitelisted in the CSP header. And in the console, we see the error refuse to frame dev1234 because it violates the following CSP directive only frame source testliveoverflow.com is allowed. But additionally, I set the report URI. So in the network request, you can see that this CSP violation triggered a request to the attacker domain, attackerliveoverflow.com slash leak, including the details of the violation, specifically the blocked URI, which is dev1234. So now the attacker knows the unique URL of this particular user, can automatically craft a malicious form and trigger a CSRF post request to upload an arbitrary file. Awesome. So I definitely wouldn't have figured out the multi-parsing bypass, but I'm not so sure about the CSP leak. Maybe, maybe not, depends on if I have gotten a creative burst. However, CSRF itself seemed pretty easy to find. An endpoint without proper CSRF protection is easy to identify. Maybe I couldn't have fully executed a full chain because of the unique URL, but those restrictions seem a bit secondary. For example, even without the multi-parsing bug, you could argue you could trick a user into filling out a form with a file. They think it's harmless, but it's uploaded to their cloud shell. So I personally would have reported the lack of CSRF protection regardless. Anyway, OBMI got $5,000 as a reward for this bug. So kudos, really cool tricks used, and I definitely learned something. I have to say this chain looks 100% like a web CTF challenge. But I guarantee you, if those tricks were required in a CTF challenge, people would say, this is unrealistic. But nope, weird stuff happens all the time and this write-up shows it. I love it. OBMI has two more reports here. One of them, an OAuth token hijacking in Google Cloud Shell editor, which was rewarded with $5,000. This was a pretty typical token leak issue. The state parameter contains a URL the user is intended to be redirected to after authentication, where it adds the token to it. And OBMI noticed that the domain is not properly checked and could enter a malicious domain. So whenever a victim would access this URL, the token would be added to a redirect to the malicious attacker domain. So the attacker can grab that auth token and can use it to access the cloud shell of the victim. And lastly, uh, XSS in Google Cloud Shell. Very standard reflected XSS. Parameter name is not properly escaped in the error output. And as I said, the XSS report also has a few more details about the domain name leak because the unique domain has to be known here too. It wasn't very detailed in the CSRF post. But here OBMI showed that this request to SSH cloud google com dev shell proxy auth user will redirect to the unique domain, like my example redirect. So in principle, 
all three bugs are typical web security issues, which I could have also found. But the few tricks used to pull off a proper POC, especially the multi-parsing bug, awesome. Really nice work. Eh. Live overflow from the future checking in. So I had prepared a first version of this video and sent it over to Eduardo at Google, who then responded, I think for the multi-part upload, you could use fetch. And I was like, um, how do I explain this that this doesn't become super embarrassing now? I guess let me just tell you this different solution to perform the multi-part file upload. Eduardo pointed out you could simply use fetch. If you ever tried to create asynchronous JavaScript requests, you might have used XML HTTP request. Fetch provides a better alternative. It's a simple function with a lot of different options to create requests. Obviously, they have to obey the same origin policy, but like I said, a post request to another domain is perfectly fine. So you could simply write JavaScript code like this to set the content type, even include the boundary, and then simply use the full expected request body, including the new lines and everything. When this is executed, you can see the request with its content type and data. So isn't it fascinating that the bug hunter also apparently failed to just use this simple solution? Clearly, OBMI is absolutely capable and has the skills of using fetch, but for whatever reason, they didn't, and instead found a crazy request parser bug. Talking about overcomplicating things, can't see the forest for the trees. It's so easy to forget about such simple things, especially when you work with much more complicated systems. It just shows you need to practice and even read up again on more basic stuff all the time. It's a lot of practice and you forget stuff. This is very, very interesting to me. Now, back to the video. Let's move on to the next write-up. These are actually by Wouter, WTM. He's the bug hunter I made that one video with before. And these bugs are closely related to the stuff explained there. So I actually suggest you to watch that previous video and check out the write-up yourself. No need to go over it again. But the conclusions I draw from these write-ups are, he did a lot of research trying to understand and map the architecture of the whole cloud shell. And the bugs he found are not typical web security issues. Impact-wise, they were similar to CSRF or XSS, but the bugs were not standard web bugs. These are issues where I feel like I understand them, I could have maybe found them too, but it would have definitely required more time digging into the cloud shell to identify that. And then also I would have needed the luck to think about the creative attack vector that Water used. Because like I said, not typical web bug, it's something unique to this cloud shell IDE. Let's move to the third write up by Psy. A CSVSH vulnerability in Google Cloud Shell cross-site WebSocket hijacking. You can already guess from the name that this could be similar to CSRF, cross-site request forgery, but with WebSockets and not normal HTTP requests. And interestingly, the two bugs from OBMI and Psy are closely related. Psy saw that the editor uses a lot of WebSockets and similarly, like regular requests from one domain to another, the browser attaches cookies, and so WebSockets also need to have some form of protection or additional authentication to prevent access across origin. And Psy wrote, when I looked at the message passed through the WebSocket, I realized that inside the socket, no authentication seemed to happen. At the time, I suspected that the authentication of Cloud Shell's editor might rely only on that cookie which would mean that a malicious website could simply open a WebSocket connection to the Cloud Shell and like a CSIF, perform actions as the current user. But it turned out that the endpoint does validate the origin header. And that means when the request is coming from an attacker domain, the WebSocket connection is rejected. However, and this is where the first write-up by OBMI and Psy connect, OBMI also noticed that there's this second unique URI to access the Cloud Shell, which was missing the origin check. For OBMI, it was missing the cross-site request protection header check, and for Psy, it didn't perform the origin header check. It's also interesting to read what Psy says about the unique domain, because OBMI figured out a way to leak that unique URI using the auth, redirect, and CSP, and Psy didn't figure that out. 
but Psy goes into a lot of details in this exploitability section and argues for why this unique URI is not a proper protection. I really recommend for you to work through that because in there you can find all the different thoughts and ideas. It's a great example for a case where you might not have all the puzzle pieces to pull a full exploit chain, but you have some significant pieces that clearly show it's a bug regardless and it has to be fixed. Also, I wonder how you think about the following. Basically, the underlying issue for both the OBMI CSRF and the PSI CSVSH was using the direct VM URI. This could be part of a typical application setup where you have a reverse proxy in front of an internal server and the direct URL to this VM server might have been wrongfully exposed. So to fix both of these issues could be simply put it behind the reverse proxy, block the direct access. That might have been a possible fix. Now, would that then mean it was not two bugs, CSRF and CSSVSH, but it could be seen as a single bug and be called internal server exposed? This is a difficult question when it comes to bug bounties due to the reward structure per bug. But as far as I can tell, blocking access to this URL was not the fix here. Both those protections were added to the direct VM domain as well. These are the three contenders for the $100,000 prize. Who do you think should win it? Please write your thoughts into the comments. I'm really curious because I actually don't know yet. But when this video goes live, you should be able to find more information about this prize and the winners over at the official security.googleblog.com. But before you leave, they said that this is a new yearly prize. This was the first round, it will happen again in 2020. I don't know the rules for this year, but if it's similar to last year, any GCP bug in 2020 might qualify for the new prize. So you could use the public write-ups as a learning resource to understand how the Google Cloud Platform works and go hunt for bugs right now. And FYI, there's a free 12-month trial with $300 credits for the Google Cloud Platform, which is perfect for testing products that typically cost money. And maybe, hopefully, next year, you are in the finalists for the $100,000 GCP prize. I think this time I tried too.